The Monday, March 14th, 2022 meeting of the Market City Commission is now called to order at 6 p.m. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. City Clerk, roll call, please. Commissioner Bonzal? Here. <clears throat> Commissioner Davis? Here. Commissioner Hanley? Here. Commissioner Hill? Here. Commissioner Stonehouse? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Mayor? Here. And Mayor Smith? Here. Thank you. Up first, we have the approval of the agenda. Commissioners, we have a motion on this item. Pro Tem Mayor? I move to approve the agenda as written. Do we have a second? Commissioner Bonzel? I'll second that motion, Your Honor. Any discussion? All in favor, please say yes. 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 All opposed, please say no. Motion passes 7-0. I have no announcements this evening. That brings us to item number one on the agenda. We have two appointments. <coughs> Do we have a motion on these appointments? For time, Mayor? Your Honor, I move to appoint Nathan Friscorn to the Planning Commission. Um, at, of the Planning Commission to uh, be the liaison on the Board of Zoning Appeals for a term ending in 2-15-23, and Michelle Metz, the Housing Commission for a term expiring 6-14-26. And we have a second. Uh, Commissioner Hill? I second that motion. Pro Tem Mayor, any discussion? Commissioner Hill, any discussion? Appreciate their stepping up to serve. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to also express my thanks, and uh, especially Mr. Frischkorn stepping up to be that uh, BZA liaison despite just joining the Planning Commission. That's cool to see, um, and it's great to see somebody getting on the Housing Commission, especially given the uh, challenges our community is facing with affordable housing. So appreciate both of their service. Okay. Any additional discussion? All right, let's take a vote. All in favor, please say yes. 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 All opposed, please say no. Motion passes 7-0. That brings us to our first public comment session of the evening. Comments may not exceed three minutes per person. Please clearly state your name and physical address and go ahead and approach the center podium. Good evening. On behalf of, I'm sorry, I'm Mary Tavernini Dowling, 175 Bayou Street, uh, Marquette, Michigan. So on behalf of the uh, Beacon House team, I'd like to thank you for considering the pass-through of the $10,000 for the KBIC funds to help us provide our special services to families in medical crisis. We have now been open just two short months and have already seen such an impact on the communities that we serve by providing over 1,200 overnight stays so far to over 300 people from across the Upper Peninsula. These guests include cancer patients, loved ones of patients needing open heart surgery, people with brain tumors, and young parents with prematurely born babies fighting for their lives in the, in the NICU. One of our most memorable families were a father and his son who is a foreign exchange student from Mexico and was in a terrible accident when his host family brought him here to snowmobile. They stayed with, with us for the time it took him to receive life-saving surgery and to be cleared to travel again. They told us they would never forget Marquette's wonderful co-op where they shop for their fresh food every day, the kindness of the downtown shop owners where they bought all their new clothes, the history museum where they learned more about this community that was taking them into their arms, and the great cab service that shuttled them everywhere they went. <laughs> they also told us when they left that we were no longer friends, but we were definitely family. We conservatively estimate that our guests so far have spent over $100,000 in the city of Marquette, just that teeny little bit of time. Our expanded hospitality team is also making a big difference in these families' lives. And we're very proud to let you know that we've added 20 new people to our payroll uh, since our ribbon cutting. And have so including our payroll and our guest spending, we're on track to make a $1 million impact annually on the city of Marquette. So we hope that you will continue to see our beautiful new Mary G. Family Beacon House as a successful organization that's worthy of your support and an asset to the community that we live in. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? 
Good evening, John Frick, 1501 Woodland Avenue, Marquette, Michigan. <clears throat> um, I come before you this evening to share a number of concerns with the proposed project between the City of Marquette, the NMU Foundation, and the UP Health System, primarily for clarity's sake um, from past meetings. In support of openness and transparency, I would like to let you know that I am a former donor to the university as well as I'm a candidate for the Marquette City Commission this fall. Uh, let me be clear, I approve this project and hope it goes through, but with some caveats. I'm asking NMU and the City of Marquette to consider the following issues. First, potential conflict of interest. The memorandum of understanding between the city and the foundation does not contain a paragraph noting requirements that, a par that the parties refrain from activities or involvement that may or would give the impression of a conflict of interest. Currently, at least one NMU administrator and one member of the NMU Board of Trustees sit on the UPHP Board of Trustees, and additionally, one of Marquette's most active developers sits on the Board of Trustees at NMU. <clears throat> I find it interesting that the NMU's um, RFQ specifically notes that they are not subject to the Michigan Freedom of Information Act, and I would hesitate to do business with an entity that can debate issues and make decisions that affect public money, our tax dollars behind closed doors. And finally, third, during this project, I would encourage all commissioners to be open to ideas and feedback as possible. When I hear a commissioner say, this is probably one of the most critical projects we'll address, and I will do everything in my power to get it through, and then those same words are repeated the next morning on NMU Public Radio, it concerns me that perhaps the commissioner's mind is already made up without the benefit of a thorough review of plans, documents, agreements, financials, etc. And finally, it was stated two weeks ago by a commissioner that NMU and the NMU Foundation are two completely separate entities. Rest assured, the foundation and NMU are intimately linked. For example, foundation employees are hired and classified the same way NMU employees are. The CEO of the foundation is hired by the president of the university and attends board meetings and at least two NMU trustees, the NMU vice president of finance and administration and the president of NMU alumni association sit as ex officio members of the foundation's board. Um, in conclusion, I would like to encourage the city commission to withdraw its support for the MOU until these concerns are addressed or at least um, ensure that these points are addressed in the final agreement reached by NMU and the city. Thank you. And just as a reminder for the public that the commission can respond to public comments at the end of the meeting. Good evening, I wanna thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you regarding a matter of importance for your local school district. My name is Zach Sedgwick. I'm the new superintendent of Market Area Public Schools. Although relatively new to the position, it did not take long to become aware of the strong partnership between MAPS and the Marquette community. The support we've, re we've received from the city and townships has paved the way for many successes. You may be aware that on May 3rd, 2022, on the election ballot, there will be an opportunity for our community to continue supporting MAPS by way of a sinking fund renewal. MAPS is seeking a 0.934 mil pure renewal, which means there will be no additional cost to the taxpayer. The revenues generated through this millage allow MAPS to focus our general funds on programming rather than regular infrastructure construction or repairs. This renewal is crucial in light of our aging buildings. We do not use sinking fund dollars for supplies, salaries, or equipment. Sinking funds are used by school districts as a cost-effective alternative to borrowing or bonding money, which generally includes interest and or sizable legal costs to acquire. For example, you're likely aware of the much improved parking lot at Market Senior High School, the new auxiliary gym, and our vastly improved entrances in many of our buildings. These projects and many more were made possible through the funds generated by sinking funds and other tax issues. Were you to be interested, I would gladly come to one of your meetings and share a little bit more about our sinking fund renewal, including examples of projects completed in the past and those we plan to fund in the future, were voters to approve. As my team and I chart the course for moving forward, there are many exciting opportunities to creatively address the academic, social, and emotional impact of COVID-19. MAPS is in the process of implementing a more robust multi-tiered system of support, a significant focus of our newest cycle of strategic planning set to begin this spring. 
MTSS and strategic planning will be the mechanisms I hope to use in realizing growth in the impacted areas I've already mentioned. Our team has already implemented creative programming such as after school tutoring and a free summer enrichment program, all possible through state and federal dollars, along with the funds generated through local taxes. These allow MAPS to continue our mission of maximizing the academic, academic potential of every child. At Market Area Public Schools, our vision is that with the support of parents and the community, we will graduate students who are college and career ready and prepared to meet the challenges of the 21st century. I'm excited to partner with you in this mission and vision and look forward to seeing the support of our community on May 3rd. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? Anyone else? Okay, public comment is now closed. Up next, we have a couple of presentations. One is the Guardian of the Quarter. We have Mr. Jim with the UP Children's Museum here to recognize our Guardian of the Quarter. I've got some items for a Marley Heslip, and I will bring them over to the side podium, and then I'll let Jim do his magic explaining all the good things about Marley. Uh, my name is Jim Edwards, and I work at the UP Children's Museum. Your Honor, Commissioners, thank you. Uh, I'd like to present Marley Heslip. It's been a strange two years, and you would think the museum was closed. But we closed for those 12 weeks in 2020. Since then, we haven't missed a week. And you would think, as Assistant Manager Sean, uh, Sean sort of thought, we might not have had youth volunteers. But we didn't have them upstairs on the carpet in amongst the exhibits like we used to. But Wonderful folks like Marley have been out on the grass at the Maritime Museum, out in our courtyard, and now just this month, back upstairs in the museum exhibits, helping to run programs with guests. So it's been a strange and wonderful growth, back to the pioneering spirit we might remember 25 years ago. Oh, on Tuesday, the museum celebrates its 25th birthday of opening the doors to the public. Um, and I know lots of you were involved at the beginning of those things. So Marley represents the new echelon of guardians, the youth volunteers at the Children's Museum. And I am so grateful to her and Mom Patty uh, for driving her in and insisting that we can do this because we weren't sure and things have changed. We were masked, we were distant, we were outdoors. Now we are masked and indoors and holding snakes and doing paintings and making cakes with our young guests. So I am delighted to be back here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now I'm going to hand it over to Marty. She has a prepared speech. I'd like to thank Mr. Jim and the Children's Museum for this honor and opportunity to volunteer through this program. He has taught me the importance of community service and how to work a part of the team. I have become so much more independent and confident through my experience there. We have been so happy to be able to be back in business in the museum where fun can be maximized by all. During the time we cannot meet in person, Mr. Jim worked tirelessly to see that if kids could not come to the museum, he was going to bring the museum to them. There was curbside pickup of art supplies and ceiling tiles to be painted for display in the museum. There was a long distance zoom where you could r ride with a stuffed animal into space. As a guardian, we could safely participate outdoors, so that is where the program took place over the summer. We got to celebrate Lake Superior and, the, and do cool experiments with water outside the Maritime Museum. We set up canopies and we went at the Lower Harbor Park to play family games in the Kids Cove. When fall came, we met outside the museum for arts and crafts and hot cocoa in the courtyard. Everyone who participated was sent home with a free book to read and share. Eventually, small groups and family, family and friends were able to reserve time in the museum for party, private parties. I liked like my birthday party this summer. Smiley and Scrappy got to go for show and tell with, to school with Mr. Jim. It has been so magical to experience all of the hands-on stuff with others inside the museum to be able to interact with the animals and exhibits. 
in person. We are very excited that things are getting back to normal before the pandemic. Again, n none of this could be possible without the tireless efforts of Mr. Jim. He is happy to be able every day of, of the week at all hours of the day. If anyone deserves an award, it would be him. This has been in his dedication, not just through the pandemic, but for the past 25 years. This month on the 22nd, the Children's Museum will be celebrating its 25th birthday. So thank you, Mr. Jim, for helping make a childhood incredible adventure, not just for me, but all who walk in your doors. Hanley, it's a tradition that we haven't been able to do for a couple years, and we have a t-shirt and a city market bin for you, too. Thank you. Thank you so much, and congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Pleasure. It's been a couple years since we've been able to do that. That was, that was really special. All right, up next we have another presentation from the Market Area Wastewater Treatment Advisory Board by Chair Brad Johnson, and it looks like we've got our um, you know, Mark on hand here, Mark O'Neill, he runs the facility, um, and it looks like maybe a Zoom team. I'm looking, I'm seeing something pop up here. That's a future. Okay. <laughs> Minimize it. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Go ahead whenever you're ready, and once you're done, I will uh, run through the commission and see if anyone has questions or comments. Okay. Thank, thank you, you for having me. Um, Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to start out with the uh, advisory board. Um, my name is Brad Johnson with Chalkley Township. I uh, serve as the uh, chair of the advisory board. Um, the chair or the advisory board is put together by three entities: um, Market City. You got Harold Hayes, Margaret Brom, and Mary Schlitt is the alternate. Uh, Harold and Margaret are the voting members on the board. Uh, Notice down on the bottom that the city has a vacant spot. They've had that for, for several years now. Um, so it'd be nice to try to get that filled here in the near future. Um, Marquette Township is um, Leonard Bonus is a, the member and John Kangas is the alternate. And then uh, Bill DeGroot is the alternate for uh, Chocolate Township. Uh, the Market Area Wastewater Advisory Board was established um, in 77. It, uh, Mar the city of Marquette serves as a contract operator of the facility. Uh, the board oversees the operation of the facility under the provisions of the agreement. Um, we recommend rules and regulations regarding facility operations, um, allocate and assign fixed demand costs, allocate and assign operation and maintenance costs, and we make recommendations um, regarding proposed operating budget. Um, Right here, this is a per unit rate flow. Um, as you can see, um, in this year, 2022, we're lower than the last two years. What uh, this is used for is the flow coming into the plant. This is what we actually charge the entities, the other entities, or all the entities um, per month. And this is how they, in turn, bill their users. It, it's basically like a best guess on our part of uh, what we need to charge to cover our budget. It's a shot in the dark. And then at the end of the year, we true it up. So the entities either get a refund back generally because we've never nailed it, uh, or they get a bill, unfortunately. It's all flow dependent. So this picture, or um, sorry, not this picture. Um, it was, uh, the initial construction was in 51. Um, prior to 51, they just kind of, well, well, you'll see in the next picture, they just kind of discharged out into the lower harbor. Um, secondary treatment was uh, done in 78, and in 2008, they did a complete redesign and construction. Um, this picture, you can see here that there's a pluma down in the uh, lower harbor. That's just raw sewage going right into the, uh, right into Lake Superior. That was the wastewater plant. Um, this is a, also a really good picture. Um, you can see prior to uh, 78, the quality of treatment compared to nowadays. 
how much more clear it is going out into the river and lake. So accomplishments for last year, um, they maintained sus uh, sustainable regulatory compliance, um, reduced biosolids disposal cost, maintained a stable budget, formalized standard um, operating procedures, and submitted solids handling improvement SRF project plan. Um, goals for this year is to uh, secure that state SRF for the biosolids improvement project and septage receiving facility, uh, pursue more land application sites, seek grant funding opportunities, continue updating the asset management plan, continue maintaining reserve and replacement fund, and lower the maintenance costs of the cogen units. Uh, the solids handling improvement project is going to be a huge project. Um, it's adding biosolids storage so we can meet the 100 day storage. Right now we have 90 day capacity. Is that what it was? No, we're about 140 days. 140 days? Yeah, so we're like 40 days short. Um, add a new belt filter press for redundancy. Septage receiving station will add revenue and increase biogas production. Add post aeration to elimination DO permit violations, a new fire alarm system, and a vector pad improvements. This is the uh, current biosolid storage. Uh, this is what we would like to add on to to meet that 180 day you can requirement. See this, is, this is a couple of weeks old, and you can see we're almost full there. We are full now. Any questions? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I know that, uh, or uh, what I remember about the biosolids um, cogen is that they're linked in some way. And does the reduction in flow right now mean that we're going to continue to have more problems with the cogen, or how, what's that relationship? No. The as far as running the cogen units, uh, it's dependent on how much biogas we produce. Okay. So well, the flow doesn't have a huge impact on that. You know, it, it, it balances itself over the course of the year. Uh, right now, we have enough biogas to run one engine full time on biogas, and the other one we're running it on natural gas the vast majority of the time. Um, and so, is, is there um, more to know about the how JCI is going to meet that gap, or uh, is that? Well, something? no, as part of their guarantee, they knew going in that we didn't have enough biogas to run both engines all the time, 24 uh, seven. So it was anticipated that we would be burning natural gas. Uh, now that we have the units, we want to leverage them, and that's why we want to put in the septage receiving station. Not only will it increase the revenue that the facility can generate, uh, but we would produce more biogas then, with the goal of reaching the point Hopefully that we could run both engines on biogas. And are we are we using less electricity because yeah, of the cogen? Yeah, like seventy five percent less. The electric bill went down. Um, and then, uh, to what do you attribute the reduction in this year from previous years? It's like well, it's 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 mostly flow dependent. So when we come up with that number, we take a five year average of what our flows were. So we had some wet years in there, and that kind of skewers it a little bit. Right. So. Great. Thank you very much. Commissioner Bonsall. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I was going to ask the same question, so thank you, Commissioner Hill. Um, the only other question I had as I was looking at the presentation um, for the meeting was just what uh, you, you note, note in one of the, the first slides that uh, one of your roles is allocating these fixed demand costs. Um, how often are those updated? I'm just curious. I mean, we right now it says based on ownership, city of Marquette, 84 percent, Marquette That's, Township, 9 percent. That is permanent unless. Okay. The government bodies of the entities change it. Okay. So, so we have had that where Chocolate Township needed some more capacity because of the casino upgrade. Right. So they bought a 1% ownership from the city and 1% from Market Township. Okay, cool. So, so that can change. So that can change, but it would require mutual agreement by Absolutely. the parties to the agreement. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Davis, did you have something? Uh, yes. <laughs> Just starting with the end of your presentations, you say your current biosolid storage is full. 
It is. Then what do you do? Well, we have two liquid storage tanks. So what we do is we fill up one, which they're basically full. As soon as we fill up one, we start emptying the other. Now having the cake storage allows us to do that more over more period of time. Now that we don't have that anymore, we have to, as soon as we fill up one, we start filling up the other, we have to start making room. So what we're drying off the top of that tank to make room uh, is really high strength waste because we're not allowing it to sit there for a long time mm -hmm. and separate more. So it's a big challenge for us operating the treatment plant. Okay, and you're at 140 days now, and you need to yeah. be at 180. Okay. We're required to have 180. Yeah. Now we, you know, we were we bid this project out last year uh, with COVID and all that. The cost came in like two million dollars over budget. So we decided to kind of take a fresh look at it, and now with the infrastructure money, we've leveraged it for the 2023 SRF mm -hmm. because we're anticipating that's where the infrastructure money is going to be there. Okay. So we'll get more grant funding. So that's a requirement of the state, the state for you know in the more recent years are there requirements that you've newer standards and requirements from the state no but like that's PFAS? always evolving okay. uh, PFAS is definitely on the radar uh, okay. the biggest concern with PFAS would be our biosolids right now we can basically give it away and put it on farmers fields for nothing mm -hmm. other than the hauling cost if we have to take that material now because the PFAS level is so high and we have to landfill it it's going to be tremendously expensive okay uh, and then just back up to one of your early slides. I just want to make sure I heard what I thought I heard, the per unit rate for flow. And you're saying that, that each of those is what you charge the different municipalities per month? Because I was just wondering yeah. what the unit is. Per unit. Per unit is, I believe, it's 1,000 gallons. Okay. So we that get the sense. flow reports from the two townships, from their master meters. We have the master meter at the treatment plant. And then our water billing finance department bills the city in the two townships based off of that. So what we do is we take our budget, I estimate how much flow we're gonna have for the next year, and it's a complete guess. Uh, and it can change based on like this past summer, uh, it was super dry, so we didn't have nearly as much revenue. <laughs> so I think when we trued up the budget, the city got a bill and so did the townships. There's other years when they were really wet, when we have all kinds of revenue and that money then just goes right back to the three entities. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other commissioners? Commissioner Stonehouse? Thank you. Um, how about microsolids? Uh, in looking at the data from the Great Lakes, they seem to be occurring more and more places that they're, they're finding them, at least with testing. Uh, is there anything that we can do specifically for our plant that would capture those before they go out to the lake? No. Simple answer is no. I mean, if they settle out in the plant itself, I mean, we would be removing that material. But for the most part, I, from what I've read on it, they just pass right through. Is there, well, given the, the, obviously the bad things that occur when they hit the water, we don't want them to do that. We want to try and retain them. Do you, are you aware of any state programs that would be providing assets to facilities to try I, to do that? I have not. I mean, that's something I think that's on the radar of the state, but I don't think it's a high on the priority list. It'd be fascinating if Marquette could become a test program for that type of technology. It would have to be some sort of filtering mechanism, which I think mm -hmm. would be yeah, Thank you. I, I, certainly, I appreciate all that you guys do. It's a wonderfully operating facility. I don't know where we will, obviously, I don't know where we would be without it. That's a dumb statement. But to produce that much water of that quality, uh, both in and out, is an incredible achievement. And uh, thank you for all the users. Thank you. Looks like Commissioner had one other point. Yeah, thank you for raising the PFAS question. When um, do you think the next round of um, standards are going to be coming out on that? And I honestly, I haven't really heard. I, I can't say it for that. I do know now that we are required to test our biosolids uh, every once a year. Uh, we have voluntarily worked with the state, and they come in and they test our drinking water, our wastewater coming into the plant, leaving the plant, our solids, biosolids. So uh, we get that extra testing for free, basically. And but we are required to do one test a year. Do you want to say what PFAS is? Maybe explain it to people if they don't. Well, it's an emerging chemical uh, that is basically found in firefighting foam. Uh, it travels through the groundwater very easily. And it doesn't break down. So, uh, you know, certain areas, ob obviously, the airports are a huge concern. Uh, K.S. Sawyer is obviously one of them. And their water wastewater treatment plant has issues with their biocells because of that reason. 
So fortunately, our, our testing here in Marquette has been, we've always been non-detectable in our drinking water. And uh, what we have found in our wastewater has been pretty, what you would typically find for a residential area like Marquette. Yeah, thank you. It's it's a it's a very significant carcinogen, and there's a lot of concern if you're not aware that that. Um, it's also found in things like the inside of microwave popcorn, that that funny thing on that makes it kind of slippery on the inside of pop of a popcorn container and other um, non-flammables. It was enclosed for a while. It was in so there's a rising concern that this this chemical, which had this benefit of preventing fires, is actually going to turn out to be um, unfortunately a, a carcinogen as it accumulates in the environment. So thank you for keeping track of that. Mm -hmm. Any other commissioners? Mr. Stonis? Oh, I thought you were saying you needed a comment. Uh, the only thing I was going to, well, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for the presentation. My main question was um, if we have a commissioner or a couple commissioners that would like to come tour the facility, is that something that you all could yeah. accommodate? Yep. I've done the tour. I'd be happy to do it again if we maybe could get that arranged, but I think it would be eye opening for some of the commissioners who haven't had that opportunity. I know with COVID, some of those experiences kind of, you know, got put to the back burner. So yep, it just made me think of it seeing some of the pictures on your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'd also encourage you guys to come down and to one of our meetings. We meet the third Thursday of each month. So more than welcome to come down to those as well. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming Thanks. tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Up next, we have our consent agenda. Do we have a motion on consent? Commissioner Hanley? I motion that we accept the consent agenda as presented. And do we have a second? For time mayor? I'll second the motion. Any discussion? All in favor, please say yes. 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 All opposed, please say no. Motion passes 7-0. On to new business, item number five, City Commission Subcommittee. City Clerk, could we have the background, please? Thank you, Mayor. On January 31st, the Northern Michigan University Foundation provided an update at a special meeting of the City Commission regarding due diligence findings and opportunities for redevelopment at the former UP Health System Marquette Hospital site. The City Commission approved a memorandum of understanding with the NMU Foundation supporting the redevelopment project at their February 28th regular meeting. In discussions with the NMU Foundation, they have offered to include a three-member subcommittee of the City Commission as observers in their review of the proposals that will identify a master developer for the project. <laughs> this subcommittee would serve in a consulting capacity to both the NMU Foundation and City Commission throughout the development process. Fiscal effect, none by this action. Recommendation, authorize the mayor to appoint three City Commissioners to the Hospital Redevelopment Subcommittee. Alternatives as determined by the Commission. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have a motion on this item? Commissioner Hill? Uh, I move that uh, we authorize the mayor to appoint three city commissioners to the hospital redevelopment subcommittee. Do we have a second? Commissioner Stonehouse? Your Honor, I second the motion. Any, uh, well, Commissioner Hill, any discussion? Um, I'm glad that we're gonna have a continued opportunity to have um, commissioner input on the um, this very important project. And I look forward to regular updates on the progress as it's going forward. And Commissioner Stonehill? I would only say it's a great opportunity for the City Commission to remain involved in the project right from the <laughs> beginning. And again, also to be able to influence the project as it moves along. Any additional discussion from the Commission? Mr. Pro Tem Mayor? I would just add that uh, I, I think it's a great uh, at least gesture at the bare minimum from the foundation to actually bring this idea forward to us and kind of keep that good faith um, partnership going and really hit home that community aspect that they initially even said they wanted to include. I would agree. Oh, Commissioner Bonzel? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wanted to note, you know, we did have, um, you know, a member of the public, you know, express some concern about, you know, the process. Um, with the former hospital redevelopment and i think that this subcommittee is a great opportunity for the city commission um, and by extension the city of marquette uh, government to have some oversight in this process some input on this process and really make sure that you know everything is being done in a above board and ethical and transparent way and hold them accountable to commitments made in the mou so i mean i i, I mean we just approved the mou and i don't think it makes sense to withdraw from that but 
between this subcommittee and the legally binding brownfield plan that we'll probably consider at some point i think that we have the oversight and the uh the leverage that we need to make sure everything is done properly any other discussion from the commission i would just add that i think that this is a really nice gesture from the nmu foundation um to include us in that process they are not required to do that by any stretch of the imagination but uh, I think it just shows that we are partners in this and we're looking to find a way forward and finding a way that it can work best for all. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and take a quick one more. Question. Sure. Um, do we have um, a time frame of, um, I understand that there's, they're going to be reviewing the proposals. Uh, do we know um, the time frame of that just so we could get it out in front of the public? I think a city manager may have that time frame. I have it fuzzy in my mind, but I want to make sure I'll check with Karen. Yes, um, actually, I do believe there was a press release um, today, or if not uh, on Friday, that stated the RFQ is actually posted, and um, they are requesting that proposals are received back um, by April 8th or April 9th, and they would they have expressed a desire to have a decision by the end of April, so around April 22nd ish. So I would anticipate the meeting um, to review those proposals would be that week in between. Um, so unfortunately, you know, schedules may have to be considered um, for that that week um, for anybody who is selected to be on that subcommittee. So I think the week of April 11th is when the subcommittee yes. would meet is what we were looking so at. So we were shooting for so yes. I'm on. I'm yep. just making sure. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. All right. Let's go ahead and take a vote. All in favor, please say yes. 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 All opposed, please say no. Motion passes 7-0. And now that the motion is passed, I just wanted to um, add that as long as it went through, I will be appointing myself to this committee, pro tem uh, mayor and commissioner Davis, and they've agreed to help me in that um, facility. So thank you. Appreciate both of your willingness to step up. I have to say, I think every commissioner volunteered. Thank you all. Um, we all have a vested interest in this project, and I think um, we will do our best to make sure that the needs of all are, are considered and talked about. All right, moving on to item number six here, Kids Cove Playground Update and Budget Amendment. City Clerk, could we have the background, please? Thank you, Mayor. At the March 30th, 2020 meeting, the City Commission authorized submitting a Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund grant application for replacement of Kids Cove Playground with a fully inclusive universal design playground. The grant was awarded in the amount of $300,000 with a $300,000 match. Marquette Playgrounds for All, the MPFA, committed to raising all matching funds as per the attached letter. On April 12, 2021, the City Commission awarded the professional services contract to Sanders and Shapsky Associates in the amount of $77,000. Throughout the design process, it has become apparent that replacing Kids Cove with a completely accessible playground of the size and scope necessary to meet the community's expectations would be significantly more expensive. Current estimates have the construction and demolition costs at $1,350,505. Sanders and Shapsky Associates will also be seeking a change order to design the ADA restroom portion of the project, bringing their total fee to $80,200. The total project cost at this time is estimated to be $1,430,705. The MPFA, in partnership with the Community Foundation of Marquette County, has raised more than $600,000 for a total of $900,000, including grant funding, and is well on their way to securing funding for the entire project. The fiscal year 22 budget requires amendment to account for both the additional expenses and the additional revenues from MPFA fundraising reimbursements. This would result in no additional expenses to the general fund. A not to exceed amount of $1,500,000 for total expense and revenues should cover estimated costs and unforeseen changes. MPFA, Sanders and Shapsky Associates, and the Community Foundation will present the current design to the Commission. Once the budget is amended to accommodate current estimated costs, staff will submit the design to the State of Michigan Department of Natural Resources for review prior to bidding out construction. Construction is currently planned for the summer of 2022. Fiscal effect, the MPFA has committed to raising all additional funds, resulting in no change to general fund contributions by the city. A budget amendment is required to account for the additional expenditures and revenues. Recommendation, approve the budget amendment for Kids Cove Inclusive Playground and amend the budget to reflect $1,500,000 in expenditures and $1,500,000 in revenues. Alternatives as determined by the commission. Thank you, City Clerk. And commissioners, do we have a motion? Commissioner Davis? I move we approve the budget amendment for Kids Cove Inclusive Playground and amend the budget to reflect $1,500,000 in expenses and $1,500,000 in revenue. Do we have a second on that motion, Commissioner Bonsall? 
Uh, yes, I'll second that motion, Your Honor. So before we move into discussion, unless it's um, urgent, I do believe we have city staff that had a presentation they'd like to share. If you'd rather have some discussion first, I'll start with Commissioner Davis since you made the motion. Okay, we'll go ahead and have the presentation and then we can have some discussion and, and take a vote. Commissioner Hanley? For the dis do we let's ask our city attorney. Okay, yes, we do. Commissioner Hanley. I motion that we suspend the rules for discussion. And we second on that motion. Pro Tem Mayor. I will second that motion. All in favor, please say yes. 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 All opposed. Motion passes 7-0. Rules are now suspended, so we can have a presentation. Thank you, John. And all. We've got a whole wonderful crew up here. John, do you mind to introduce those who are? Yeah, so I'm just going to have maybe Kyle come up here and grab the presentation. It actually wasn't what was on the desktop here. Um, but um, Madam Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Commissioners, I'd like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to present um, to the City Commission. Um, today with me, presenting with me, we have Bill Sanders of Sanders and Chapsky Associates. Um, Bill will be also representing uh, Progressive A&E, uh, which is, uh, and Mar Mara Kaplan, uh, who uh, make up the design team that's designed the playground that you'll see today. Um, also with us today is Osha Eppensteiner, who uh, will be representing the Community Foundation of Marquette County and discussing their important role with this project. <coughs> and Luann Peterson, representing the Marquette Playgrounds for All group. Um, so, as we go through this bill, we'll talk a little bit about the design aspects of it, um, and, and we'll kind of move through in that order. Now, just a, a brief history. Um, so in 2012, um, the first uh, idea of an inclusive playground came to Marquette, and at that time, that was at Presque Isle Park. Um, in the time since, it became very apparent that that site was going to require a lot of dollars that uh, would have gone into infrastructure. So it would have gone into uh, curbing, sidewalks, uh, paving, parking spaces, things of that nature. Um, and then following that, um, it became quite apparent that Kids Cove at Madsen Park um, was quickly approaching the end of its useful life. So um, with those uh, couple of things, the City Commission uh, took action in 2017 to relocate the project to Madsen Park. Um, so that brings us kind of closer to today. Um, One second here, no pro. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try and help you. <laughs> the moderns of modern or the marvels of modern technology. There you go, Kyle. Try that. We can keep talking. You were doing a great job. All right. So, <laughs> since that time. Um, We've had uh, a lot of opportunities for public input. So there's been a couple of, uh, of uh, public input sessions that were held, as well as several meetings of the uh, Prescott Park Advisory Committee. And all of that gave a lot of opportunity for the public to give their ideas, to see what was possible, um, and really give their input. And as you'll see as we get into the design uh, parts of this, um, all of those things have been taken into account and, and sort of weaved into this design. So, And actually, all of that came before this slide, which uh, hopefully will be showing up on the screen momentarily. So that worked out perfectly. <laughs> While we wait, Jen, are you going to go through the timelines on the project and when um, as well? I think we're good to go, um, and, and we do have a slide that discusses that. So, Perfect. Thank you. Uh, this slide gives you a, sort of an overview, and Bill will talk a little bit more about the design. Uh, and then on the right, you see the, um, the, let's see if I can get rid of that. Uh, 
that's better anyway. Uh, the logo for Kids Cove and Marquette Playgrounds for All. Uh, the, the group worked hard on that and the vision. Um, the vision for the all-inclusive playground, uh, I'll just kind of go through a few points here. Um, first and foremost, it needed to be an opportunity for all kids to play. So um, that includes kids of uh, typically developing uh, status and um, anybody else. So that's the basis for an all-inclusive playground. Um, secondly, providing barrier-free recreation opportunity for children and adult caregivers uh, that can easily navigate. So um, we saw this leading up to this project and uh, prior to uh, engaging in this project, people just coming up to us and saying, hey, it's really difficult uh, once the kids are in Kids Cove and running around to get after them, find them, navigate around that, um, and any sort of mobility issues just makes that exponentially harder with wood chips. So uh, that, was, that was a big, big piece of this. Um, the third point is pretty self-explanatory, so it should be simple to use, understandable and safe, obviously. Um, next is the artistic and educational uh, opportunities. As you take a look at the design, you'll see that a lot of thought was given to the aesthetics of it, and um, there's also a couple of opportunities for public art within the space. Um, additionally, there will be a couple of uh, uh, signs that do some interpretation of the of the natural elements of our great UP. And then finally, this last point really talks about um, regional significance. So when we did the grant application. Um, You've all seen the buses that go down to uh, Kids Cove. There was a lot of interest from surrounding school districts um, within the UP, and they were very interested in, once we get this built, being able to bring their kids and having everybody be able to play at it. So that was huge, and it will be an awesome piece. What makes a playground accessible and all-inclusive? I like this first line. Uh, play is our first introduction to the world around us. I think it's so important for play, um, for developing children, for our kids. And personally, I think as a human throughout life, but I'm a recreation guy, so you know, <laughs> take that with a grain of salt. Um, a few key points. Number one, the surfacing. So this will be a poor in place surfacing. What that is is a thin rubber layer with some squishy stuff underneath. Um, what it amounts to is a very nice surface to navigate. Um, be that if you utilize um, any sort of assistive device or if you're just running, jumping, skipping, and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, but it also is engineered to handle the, um, the fall heights from the specific pieces of equipment that we've selected. So it uh, varies a little bit in thickness throughout the playground based on those heights. Um, second piece of this is to provide a better line of, of sight. So that's you know being able to see your child uh, be if it's your, your child, grandchild, or someone you're taking care of. Um, that is another challenge with the existing uh, playground. Once they're in there, it's like, where'd they go? So um, this uh, is an important piece of an accessible playground. Um, the next is obviously that the equipment will allow access for all. There's a whole bunch of ways to do that. Um, and the design team has done a great job of coming up with the best ones for our playground. So, And they'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, another piece that makes the playground accessible and inclusive is a fence all the way around it with one entrance and one exit. So again, it makes it easier and less stressful for uh, those taking care of the kids. Um, and obviously, um, an accessible, all-inclusive playground uh, will allow children with various abilities to play and learn together. I think that one's really important. I think as, as humans, it's really easy for us to um, hone in on the differences. And uh, when we take children, we allow them to uh, play and learn together. Um, real quickly, they get over those differences and start having fun. And I think that that leads to uh, better development throughout life. Um, and I think it also you know, tends to eliminate you know, some of the um, you know, thoughts that might be a barrier to that. And it makes our community stronger. So I think that's a huge point. And the last point is you know, supporting the family. So uh, this design would do that with an accessible 
family restroom that would be built into the existing footprint of the building there and um, you know a few other amenities that uh, would be throughout the design that's pretty important we didn't think we could actually call it accessible if the restrooms aren't accessible so we thought that was a huge huge piece of it well without further ado I'm going to turn it over to Bill Sanders thank you John is uh staying close by because he promised he'd get out his shepherd's hook if I talked too much and it's really hard to talk uh, just a little bit about Kids Cove because it is such a cool project. Um, so as John mentioned, we, we did have a number of public events. The slide that you see on the screen now was the result of that. So we, we put together this preliminary plan um, based on public input. Um, and we tried to show all of the different types of pieces, uh, play equipment that could be part of Kids Cove. Um, sort of testing the big ideas about uh, a central area where parents could keep a close eye on their kids if they wish. They could visit with each other kind of the same way that kids are playing together on the playground. And uh, the other th sort of big picture idea on this plan was the hill slide. Um, kind of one of the one of the main things about inclusive play is you want every child to be able to be in the middle of play in the middle of everything um, so that's and, and be able to access everything so that that coolest thing on the playground um, which they would all need to be able to access is that hill hillside area and um, so I know it's kind of hard for you to uh, maybe see on the screen in front of you but hopefully you can visit this presentation later and see a little better pictures of each of the uh, pieces of play equipment. Is this the button here? Yeah, just yeah, the, yeah, the right one. That one. Okay. All right. So we took all of that information, sort of distilled the project in into the uh, final plan. So on the lower right corner is the main entrance to the playground. So one of the key things is one way in, one way out for the playground. So you can um, manage children that may be uh, flight risk. Um, one, of, one of the things parents communicated to us early on is that they were terrified to bring their children to Kids Cove because they could disappear so easily. Mm -hmm. To the east, you got the lake. To the north, you got the parking lot. Or, I'm sorry, um, do I have that backwards? Yeah, to, to, the, to the south, you got, yeah. Well, you know, you know where, where the directions are. But anyway, those were, those were uh, scary things for parents. Um, so that's where the fence around the whole playground, one way in, one way out. And you can see the little star in the middle, that's sort of that gathering space where you can pretty easily keep track of what your kids are doing and where they're at in the playground. The other um, big idea is that the path that you see going around the playground is what we call the orientation path. And that's really important, especially for children that may be on the autism spectrum. So they, they can visit the playground kind of from the outside, figure out where everything is, uh, minimize any surprise as they move into the middle um, and begin to play. Um, so that, that's really important. Um, and then also uh, that path represents about nine laps to the mile. So if parents want to get a little exercise <laughs> <laughs> while their kids are playing, um, they can do that. Um, but what it really does is it makes that coolest thing accessible to everyone. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, we're sort of building that uh, hill. Obviously, it's a pretty flat site. So you see sort of a straight line along the top of the drawing. That's a retaining wall that will face Lakeshore uh, Boulevard. So it, it'll provide at the, at the east end maybe two feet high and at the west end about seven or eight feet high. And it's sort of emerging that that maybe an opportunity for an art wall of sorts. You know, I can see maybe the Children's Museum, kids down there chalking artwork or whatever. It could be pretty cool. Um, the central entrance circle is also a place where, and you'll see in the images, we've got this grand vision of a, a dragonfly um, sculpture uh, placed up above that so you'd walk in under it. And Luann and Zosia can talk a little more about the significance of that to the project, which you may be 
already well aware of. Um, uh, also, uh, picnic areas are outside the fence, so children with um, food allergies don't have to worry about that when they're at play. And then the other thing, and this is sort of really relates to what John talked about with inclusion. Um, the swing zone, we've, we've sort of grouped types of play in zones. So children that are swinging um, are together and each of the pieces of equipment offers different levels of challenge. So within the zone, maybe a child that's uh, in a wheelchair is close to a child that's on the belt swing, um, so they're together. But then in addition to that, we worked really hard so that each piece of equipment provides multiple levels of challenge. So on the right side is a swing zone. At the top is a spinning zone. Then, then of course, we have the hill slide. On the lower left, um, you see that sort of starburst thing. That's a uh, um, climbing zone. And then to the extreme lower left is the uh, a music kind of sort of imagination play sort of space. Um, there's another little bubble at the extreme south, and this is also part of supporting the family, is a uh, quiet zone, we call it. So a child that might be overstimulated and um, start to have some, some trouble can go there and sort of recover their composure and continue to play rather than having to leave the playground and go home. Um, so that's, that's kind of an important piece. And, and um, I'm gonna try and go a little bit faster here. John's giving me the evil eye. Um, but uh, please stop me if you have any questions as we go. I'll reserve questions till the end of the presentation. Okay. Right. And um, yeah, we do probably need to get moving. I, okay. I think this was a five minute presentation. So. Right. Uh, okay, um, uh, yeah, so, so this, this next series of slides are really renderings of the playground. This is looking from the parking lot. It shows kind of the dragonfly idea. Um, you know, and just understand that these plantings are just representational, you know, not really what, what you'll see when we're done. Um, this next slide shows that central seating area. Uh, this, the uh, slide zone is beyond, uh, beyond that. Um, toddler zone off to the left. This is the picnic area. It just connects simply between existing parking lot and existing bike path, so it makes a nice connection there. Uh, the swing zone. So the, in this representation, it, it shows just belt swings. But just so you know, we have four special swings as part of that. Uh, we have two where a parent sits in the swing and a toddler seat would face them so they can face each other when they swing. And a similar sort of thing with a uh, ADA swing with the parent uh, coupling. Uh, the, we're showing a sort of a two-fro double-seater swing off to the bottom left there, but in reality, that's a kind of a bird's nest sort of swing. And then the one on the right, you can actually wheel a wheelchair onto and uh, swing with your friends. This is looking straight through that entrance uh, towards the back again. Um, uh, just skip ahead here. This is a spinning zone. So on the lower right, that spin unit there actually provides three levels of challenge. So a child that uh, um, may be disabled can sit in the flat space. They can put a harness on. They can sit there without uh, any support. Um, the slope sides, the faster that thing goes around, um, you'll have to hang on for dear life to not uh, go sailing off. So. Um, and then the, the spinner at the top is actually something that's flush to the ground and you can wheel right in. It has a little turnstile in the middle so a child in a wheelchair or otherwise can help spin the unit. Um, you know, you can go around the outside in your wheelchair and turn the whole thing. So it's really uh, pretty cool. Uh, the net climber there at the top is one of the ways to get to the top of the slide hill. So that, that definitely provides some challenge. Uh, it's just a general overview picture here. Um, the uh, spinning zone is at the upper right. Um, the music zone is upper left. 
another kind of overview of the whole area. Um, this is really kind of looking at the top of the hill on the right. So not only do you get to the top to go down the slide, but there are also gathering spaces there. You know, parents can sit there, kids can congregate there, play there, etc. And then the path diagonally goes down the hill um, off to the left there. This is another view at the top. And again, uh, you know, the hill, hill slide there. The unit on the left, you can see there's a transfer platform in the middle. So it's actually a climbing unit, but it has three levels of challenge. So that's where, where the child that maybe um, transfers from a wheelchair is in the middle of play. They're in the middle of everything while kids are climbing on the top. There's ropes they can pull up. It's, it's really kind of a cool piece. Uh, the other one, and, and it's kind of neat because, you know, we talk about the, the slide being the coolest thing on the playground, but you'll go to a lot of playgrounds where you'll see things that are the coolest thing on their playground, and you also have it at Kids Cove, like the Wego Round and the double uh, cone spinner. Um, you know, a lot of playgrounds, that's the coolest thing, but you've got all of that stuff at Kids Cove. Um, that's looking back at the toddler zone. I think this next one is, oh, the other, the other neat thing is this uh, trampoline, uh, wheelchair trampoline, which is pretty cool. And let's see, that's just another view. Uh, this is the music zone. So we have sort of a palisade of uh, um, uh, timber columns. It's not treated wood, they're timber columns, but it's not treated wood. We have music. Uh, kids can sort of pretend they're like they're performing. It's up a little bit higher. Um, really cool spot. And they're actually tuned instruments. So some of the musicians in the area uh, can be challenged to come to Kids Go and play, you know, real music on these things. This is coming down the path from the top. The uh, music is in the front. We're kind of working on trying to get a little telescope at the end of the hairpin on this. Uh, uh, sidewalk. These are things we haven't told John about yet, but we're sort of kind of working on those as we're going through the design. So, uh, a good surprise. And this is another view of that. So, you know, we're trying to keep some green space in there a little bit, you know, stuff that won't get trampled to death, just, just to give the whole playground a little topography. And this is that little quiet zone, which is really pretty cool because it, it, there's been a lot of research that has gone into the development of this thing. And you'll see there are like little squiggly things, little things kids can fidget with uh, when they're overstimulated because it helps uh, bring them back down a little bit. And just, just that action of working with their hands. And this is the last slide I, I'm gonna speak to, but it, for us, it's maybe one of the really important ones um, that family bathroom is really critical uh, to the way Kids Cove will work. And it just turns out there's space in the pavilion building there that we can work that in without too much uh, effort. And uh, that'll be really a great thing. So with that, I'll get out of the way. Thank you very much. And I'll just provide yeah. a really quick update on the financials here. The Community Foundation serving as the fiscal agent for the community match. So uh, partnering with the Playground for All Committee and the City of Marquette to make this possible for our community. And you'll see from the report that at the end of the year, the balance was a little over $130,000. In two very um, quick months, the work of the committee and, um, and all of the efforts combined and the generosity of this community has brought the balance in the fund with the Community Foundation to over $634,000. So um, Luann will speak a little bit more about some of the ongoing efforts around the fundraising. Um, but again, I think with, with already doubling the amount of the community match that was required by the DNR grant in that short time, we're excited to uh, continue getting the support from the community, both individuals, corporations, um, some grants that are in place. So these are all ongo ongoing efforts. Um, and then of course, in-kind donations and pledges that have already been made in that um, short period of time. So we're excited to get past the 
million dollar mark and, and looking forward to um, to get shovels in the ground for real, that. real quick just to add on um, just in the short time since I wrote the agenda supplement you can notice that the total is already about forty four thousand dollars more than than we had in there so these guys are marching right at, right along so and on, on behalf of the uh, playgrounds for all committee I would really like to thank the city of Marquette for stepping up and uh, providing a place with the community foundation for kids of all abilities to be able to play and be together. So thank you for your forward thinking. And on these last two slides or three slides, you'll see some um, simple ways to support the project. So visiting the Kids Cove website will give you the designs and some of these sponsoring opportunities. Um, that information is easily accessible through the Community Foundation website as well, um, where you can also donate online or send in a check um, with Playground for All in the memo line. And like I said, um, Luann will just share a little bit more about some as of the- As you can see, these are our ongoing fundraising activities. We've written a lot of grants and we continue to write a lot of grants. And really the community has stepped up to the plate and it'll be fun to see this come to fruition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I really appreciate the presentation and learning a little bit more about the project. Uh, I think the, the commission would definitely join me in those sentiments. Um, this is going to be a really great project. Timeline, when do we think it'll be completed? That was my main question. And will it be under construction all summer, so not accessible to the public? Yeah, so the timeline is, is slightly flexible uh, following your action tonight, assuming that it'd be positive. Mm -hmm. um, we would be submitting the bid uh, documents to the state for their review as part of the grant. Um, so we have a little bit of a wild card on their timing, uh, but our goal is to start construction as soon as possible this summer. So. so that would mean the playground would be out of commission for this summer through mm -hmm. the fall, probably. Yep. And in the next summer, maybe, or just one no, season? No, uh, the, the intention is, is one, one season, so. Okay. There is green space in that same park. It's not the same, but, you know, at least there's somewhere for the kids to run. Exactly. Hopefully not directly into the lake. <laughs> Commissioner Hill. I've, um, folks have asked me what's going to happen to the equipment that's there, and particularly to the poles and things. Is there a plan uh, for reusing the, the wood that's there? Yeah, at this time, um, none of the actual equipment could be reused as a playground equipment just because standards have changed in the 25 years. Um, and the, the wood is of a, a composition, treated of a composition that's not acceptable for residential use. So. We're not um, looking to reuse it in that way. The slats from the donations, um, the, the pickets that make up the fence, um, Rotary is going to be doing uh, a project to uh, disassemble and, and get those back to folks that might may want them. So if you donated to the last um, Kids Cove, the last generation, uh, you would be able to get that back. Um, and then any of the, um, if there's any piece pieces of the existing that maybe um, are metal and recyclable, we may work with um, a local artist to kind of utilize them in that way. So. Any other questions before we go ahead and take a vote? Or, oh, Commissioner Davis? I just want to thank um, the Playgrounds for All for being here. This is, you know, as our mayor said, just such a wonderful um, addition to our community. And we're doing a lot of significant things, but to think that this will have this kind of an impact not only for our residents but for visitors without any money from the general fund and we have the state grant and we have wonderfully committed playgrounds for all committee with all kinds of different talents that are raising a phenomenal amount of money and we just have the right combination of committed citizens and a community foundation and the city involvement and the community involvement and the youth involvement and the right architect for for all of this to happen. It's really exciting. So thank you very much. Commissioner Bonson. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I want to echo you know, what uh, Commissioner Davis said and, and also just uh, yeah, sincerely thank all of you for your efforts. Um, I, I mean, looking at this project, I've been really excited about it. Of course, we've been talking about it for a while. And in a lot of ways, it's really the perfect, the most perfect project in, a, in many respects that I think I've seen since being elected to the commission and that even though you know, we're, the city's facing significant budgetary constraints because it's essentially almost entirely funded through grants and 
you know, philanthropic contributions, um, it, it, we're able to do something really incredible. And I think this is an example of, you know, even during kind of tight times, um, you know, we're, we're able to do some great things for the community precisely because we have such amazing community uh, support and organizations that are, are, are making these things possible. Um, and a lot of really generous people that have contributed. The only question that I had um, is, you know, I mean, just general gut feeling, how are you all feeling about you know, being able to start construction this summer, um, given that there is still a significant amount of money to be raised. Yeah, I think we're feeling uh, more and more confident. There's uh, some supply chain issues that could potentially, you know, cause cause issues, but we're not seeing that right now. The state could be a wild card. Um, initially, you know, possible fundraising was was maybe a question, and I'm not seeing that right now. So, um, at this point, I'm I'm feeling pretty confident. Awesome. Thank you. That's great to hear. And I mean, just anecdotally, um, having heard from some people in the community, I think there are just about everybody that has kids and grandkids in Marquette is really excited about this from what I've heard. So thanks for everything you're doing. Any other discussion from the commission? Commissioner Stonehouse. Thank you for recognizing a problem, grabbing onto it and solving it. And I think that's what makes the city so strong is people and groups being able to do that. Thank you. I would just echo that I am very excited for this project. I share a lot of the concerns that have been shared by other parents <laughs> down there, especially not being able to see your kids. There are certain areas I won't let my kids go because I can't find them again. But thank you. Um, appreciate all of you. And I think we're going to go ahead and take a vote so you can go ahead and take a seat. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, City Clerk, do you mind to read the motion that was made? Yes. Remind me who made the motion and who made the second, please. <laughs> I can do that. Uh, the motion was Commissioner Davis, seconded by Commissioner Bonzal, to approve the budget amendment for Kids Cove Inclusive Playground and amend the budget to reflect $1,500,000 in expenditures and $1,500,000 in revenues. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second on the floor. Any additional discussion before we go ahead and take a vote? I think we've covered it. All in favor, please say yes. 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 All opposed, please say no. Motion passes 7-0. Up next, we have number seven under new business, the My Next Cities item. City Clerk background, please. Thank you, Mayor. As Michigan moves toward carbon neutrality, forward-looking cities ready to integrate energy solutions backed by thorough research, ambitious policy, and thoughtful urban planning will be critical. The My Next Cities program, developed by Next Energy, is engaging stakeholders statewide to identify and deploy tailored solutions that improve energy solutions backed by research, policy, and urban planning for a broad spectrum of residents. My Next Cities is working on a roadmap for small to mid-sized cities to make Michigan a leader in the deployment of smart city solutions and one of the first states to fully capture the benefits promised by convergence of next generation smart energy and mobility solutions. The goals over the three-year project are to identify and deploy tailored smart city solutions, ensure benefits are equitably distributed among residents, and provide a roadmap to implement similar solutions across the state. In addition to Next Energy, the program is being supported by public sector consultants, a nonpartisan public policy research and consulting firm, and an advisory group composed of several entities, including the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, the Michigan Department of Transportation, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, the Michigan Municipal League, and others. The City of Marquette will work with Next Energy to explore current and existing city initiatives that work to improve energy efficiency, reliability, and safety, conduct public outreach, and identify financial assistance tools to formulate technology solution deployments. Year one will be centered around community engagement and strategy design, and years two and three will be the implementation and data gathering phase. This memorandum of understanding is in accordance with the priorities set in the City of Marquette strategic plan and the recently passed resolution for climate action. Fiscal effect, none by this action. Recommendation, authorize the mayor and city clerk to sign the memorandum of understanding with Next Energy Center. Alternatives, as determined by the commission. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have a motion on this item? Commissioner Hanley. I motion that we authorize the mayor and city clerk to sign the memorandum of understanding with Next Energy Center. And we have a second, pro tem mayor. I'll second the motion. 
Commissioner Hanley, discussion? Um, I think this is a fantastic plan to help us move forward with all the goals and objectives that we have set forth to try and reach uh, with more energy and with our climate action plan. I think it's nice to see some movement on the climate action plan and having steps going forward. And I'm excited to see what comes of this. Mayor, anything to add? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, you know, I just want to hit on that this, this aligns with several of the priorities that we laid out in our strategic planning process. And it just being one of three communities, the other two being uh, Dearborn and Flint to, uh, I guess, be selected to pursue this kind of test pilot program um, to pursue kind of a next generational smart energy and mobility solutions and a smart city approach. It's just uh, it's an incredible opportunity for us. And I think it'll also open the door for a lot of possibly state and federal funding to achieve some of these initiatives as well. Any other discussion by the commission? Commissioner Bonzel. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think this is, what, what I think is really cool about this is that not only were we one of only three municipalities in the entire state selected to, to participate and certainly by far the smallest, but that this is the sort of thing that you know, really like we, we would like to do a lot more of planning and kind of like really getting into the weeds and solving um, some, you know, kind of technical um, or very detail oriented problems, but that because of the day to day operation of the city of Marquette, you know, we often have, I, I think, you know, as commissioners and our staff, we often struggle to find the time to do it. So I think this is a really great opportunity for the city that doesn't cost taxpayers anything. Um, and uh, I mean, in fact, you know, the, the MOU says that no payment's going to be made by either party, by the other party as a result of, to uh, either party, by the other party as a result of this MOU. Um, so yeah, I think this is a really great deal for the city of Marquette. I'm excited to see what they find. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Hill? Um, I wanted to ask some questions about the MOU. So if we go down to the joint responsibilities, city of Marquette responsibilities, and next energy responsibilities. Um, well, it is it's terrific that this work is um, is being funded, and it doesn't cost the city anything. At the same time, that raises a concern for me about um, who's going to be making decisions, and um, particularly how that's going to happen. Um, and so. I would, I'm, I'm going to pass this tonight, but I do ask that um, the quest, the, that the project team, when the project team is named, that we um, we get regular updates on this. I'm, I'm concerned that um, we get annual updates from the JCI, which aren't clear and aren't actually all that helpful for us to understand our climate, uh, our um, impact on the climate. I don't want to repeat where someone else is doing all of the work. There's a 15 minute presentation and, and we don't know actually what's, what the impact is. And I, I, I know these folks, these are very good folks. I'm not saying even at JCI doesn't, those are, are good people, but I think there really needs to be beefed up communication. Um, we don't know, we, we can't, I, I don't think any of us here can explain what JCI's numbers are. And so I, I don't want, I want there to be a, some more accountability around what the actual impact of this is going to be. I understand too that with this project, it's, it is more forward thinking as Commissioner Bonsell said, but let's make sure that we understand who the project team is, how decisions are going to be decided. Um, this question of actually going into implementation, there certainly is going to be financial um, impacts of that and they can be, of course, very beneficial to move into this, these new directions. But um, I would ask that uh, city staff have um, create a process for us to understand um, how we're going to get feedback and how it will uh, dovetail with the work that JCI has done and will do. And then lastly, how this will actually support a climate plan for the in-city that the community can participate in. Any additional discussion? Mr. Stonehouse? I would only add, Your Honor, that uh, like all such agreements and all such plans, communication up and down becomes critical. And I think Commissioner Hill certainly explained that very carefully. 
That said, this was a remarkable opportunity for us to profit by the efforts of others and the expertise of others, and I don't think we should be anything other than enthusiastic about it and the potential that can come out of it. But again, I would also emphasize that the city of Marquette is not buying this plan. There's no money involved in it. This is something that really puts us in a different par with the opportunity, as very cleverly uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Mayor said, the opportunity perhaps to leverage federal and state monies into the city to furthermore assist with the development of the Climate Action Plan, too. So this is a good one. Glad to see it. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Davis? Um, I am very much in support of, of this MOU, and I think it's a great opportunity to, for us to move forward on a lot of our initiatives and a lot of our wishes for the city. I also want to recognize some of what Commissioner Hill is saying is that in the grant world, which is this is kind of like that, the good news is you have a grant and the bad news is you have a grant, that this will certainly take time of our staff time and it even says in the responsibilities as of our commissioners. I'm happy to spend time with this group doing some of this, this because I think that Marquette will be a model for, for cold weather cities and small cities and not only in Michigan but around the U.S. So I'm very enthusiastic about this project but I will caution that yes it will take work. It will take work by our staff and it will take work by our commissioners and it will take work by some of our stakeholders in the community. Commissioner Bonzo. Yeah, thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I think that's very well stated, um, Commissioner Davis, and, and thanks for bringing up um, those issues of communication, um, Commissioner Hill. I, I think that um, the point that I believe Commissioner Hill made was especially important, which is that we need to make sure that this is, uh, you know, dovetailing with, that we need to understand how these efforts are dovetailing with the JCI work that's already been done um and that continues to happen so and, and i also just wanted to ask a question I, I suppose maybe for the city manager just to clarify that this isn't uh you know it's like a, a substitution for you know the commitments we made to get a citizens climate work group together either right this would be complementing those efforts correct i do believe this would be complementing that and that is this is serving something i think even broader than just our climate action plan. So I think they would be working hand in hand and they are, um, Next Energy is aware of, of our um, commitments and the work that we have already started as well. Great, thank you. That was my understanding, but just wanted to make sure. Thanks. Any other discussion from the commission? I just wanted to add on to what Commissioner Bonhansal just said in, you know, in the dovetailing regard. I also think that this will flow nicely in with our Fewer future strategic planning, but then also our master planning process, which I know we're going to kick off by talking with the planning commission at our work session tomorrow a little bit. So uh, more to come on that, but I do see this as a really exciting opportunity and a unique opportunity that not many municipalities have in the state of Michigan. So thank you all. Let's go ahead and take a vote. <coughs> right. We have a motion and a second on the floor. All in favor, please say yes. 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 All opposed, please say no. Motion passes 7-0. That brings us to our second public comment session of the evening. Comments may not exceed three minutes per person. Please clearly state your name and physical address unless you've already done so at this meeting. Margaret Brum, 404 East Magnetic Street. First thing I wanted to say is thank you to um, Captain Blake in the Marquette Police Department. At the end of our last meeting, I showed him a picture of the car of a friend of mine who'd gotten T-boned in a um, parking lot at Super One. And my friend, thankfully, was not injured, but she was incredibly shook up. And the car, by the way, is still absent without leave. I, I have no idea where it is. But I shared with uh, Captain Blake, and I said, I know it didn't happen in the city. Um, I could have lost my friend. I could have lost my next door neighbor. Is there anything the city can do? And by first thing the next morning, there was a very helpful public service announcement on Facebook from the city of Marquette Police Department reminding people just how dangerous parking lots can be. And the first thing, it was divided into drivers and pedestrians, and the first line for each of them was, don't get hit by a car. And I, I know that sounds really, really basic, but my friend was just trying to get in and out of Super One, and she wasn't focused on the risk, and that is a very risky place to be. So I uh, had the um, 
pleasure of walking over and showing her the public service announcement and saying, it's possible this was inspired by what happened to you. And she was uh, very appreciative of the fact that her small accident had caused other people to take notice. So I'm appreciative of the fact that when I brought it up, it wasn't waved off as, hey, it didn't happen in the city. It's not our concern. Number two, starting tomorrow, the blue salamanders are migrating on the island. I was one of the first people to be skeptical of the need to uh, stop smucking blue salamanders with vehicles until I listened to the northern scientist, Eli, describe what he had found out about the blue salamanders and the huge loss of life they were uh, incurring in their migratory patterns. In addition to identifying the blue salamander as an issue, he also has identified a new species of salamander and has uh, published his work with a, a salamander scientist out in Minnesota. So in, I'm coming around full circle on this. The island road will be shut. John, it's 8 p.m. every night from now. Um, stay off the road, please, and no bicycles either because you can kill a lot of salamanders with the bicycle. And I've done some reading on salamanders, and it turns out they're a keystone species. And the identification of, of a huge amount of blue spotted salamanders makes Marquette unique. And so uh, please uh, enjoy uh, going out there. I've got a headlamp this year I bought. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see me a salamander this year. Last year they heard me sneaking up on me and ran away. But this year I'm going to see it. But please respect this and do not go out to the island with a vehicle after 8 o'clock. Um, thank you very much. Anyone else for public comment? Anyone else? Seeing no further public comment, public comment is now closed. That brings us to comments from the commission. We'll start things off with Commissioner Hanley and go down the line. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll keep it brief tonight. I just want to thank uh, the Mr. Jim and the Children's Museum for coming today and celebrating the Guardians of the Quarter. This was my first experience with it, and I think it's a great program to go forward. I'm also very excited for the 25th anniversary of the Children's Museum. My son loves going there. I, when I moved here, I, I can't imagine this area without it. It's been here the whole time I've lived here, and I think it's fantastic, everything that they do there. Also, that in conjunction with uh, the new playground that's going in, it looks phenomenal. And being able to see my kid when we're on the playground is going to be a huge help. He's not a runner, but it's still nice to know where your four-year-old's running around at. So it'll be, really, it'll be a really good thing. And I also love how inclusive it is throughout the entirety of the park, not only for people with different abilities, but for the, regular, for, or, or for the average child. They can do the exact same things, and they can have fun on all the same things, which I think will do, as John said, and bridge a lot of relationships that may not have been formed before. So I want to thank you guys for all the work that you've done on that. Pro Tem Mayor. I think I'm good tonight. <laughs> Commissioner Hill. Um, I have a question. Is tomorrow's meeting with the Planning Commission, is that going to be broadcast? I don't believe so because it will be at the Municipal Service Center to allow for more space. Okay. So uh, I invite everyone to the Municipal Science Center tomorrow, Science Centers, Municipal Service Center tomorrow uh, for a conversation with the Planning Commission. Um, I, we know, um, we hear over and over how critical housing issues are. It's impacting our businesses, it's impacting people's qualities of life, folks, uh, want to live here and can't and 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 it's it's really really impacting our community in this conversation tomorrow with the Planning Commission we're going to get an update on how the land development code has uh, adjusted to um, allow for their private residences to allow more housing and how that can benefit our um, our entire community by making um, as we bring in more housing, that is critical to the other piece of the equation, which is the cost and the tremendous burden that the high energy cost, high uh, housing costs are having on um, our residents, our potential residents, the folks who want to be here. So I'm really glad we um, are, are going to have that conversation tomorrow at 5:30 over on Wright Street. I hope you join us. Uh, and yes, and also congratulations. Uh, really wonderful to hear about the kids' code today. Thank you so much, you all, for all that you've done. It's just wonderful to see. And the happy anniversary to the, to the uh, Children's Museum. 
Commissioner Stonehouse? Yes, uh, yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Good work done tonight. Um, a lot of it done tonight. And this is uh, this is government in action. I think this is a transparent way of trying to show the public what is happening and how it's being done. I would also point out my thanks to uh, Commissioner Hanley for delivering <laughs> the donuts to the, uh, or excuse me, the cupcake to the Guardian of the Quarter. Uh, we're certainly restarting a tradition we haven't had going for perhaps two and a half years. Finally, there's a rumor that spring is coming. I'm, look, <laughs> I'm looking at those temperatures, and if we can hit 40 or 45, it's going to be people in shorts and T-shirts and laying on the beach. Believe me. <laughs> but uh, certainly a good night. Thank you, Your Honor. Commissioner Bonsall. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I also just want to uh, congratulate our guardian of the quarter, uh, Marley, and, and thank Mr. Jim and everybody at the Children's Museum for everything that they've been doing um, for kids in our community. Um, I think it's that kind of activism and especially getting people in, engaged in the community at a young age that not only makes our community an amazing place to live here and now, but will hopefully for many years to come. So, um, and in that spirit, I, I'm, I just want to say I, I, I think that tonight's meeting was very productive. I, I think we're planting the seeds um, to the solutions to some you know, serious uh, you know, problems and community needs that we have in Marquette. Um, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, the uh, potential redevelopment of a huge and, you know, potentially, you know, vacant, potentially blighted property in the city, whether we're talking about meeting housing needs through that project or through our discussions with the Planning Commission tomorrow night. Um, and, uh, you know, the Kids Cove Playground is going to be such a wonderful asset for families and kids in Marquette. Um, so I, I, it's nights like tonight, it's why I ran for the city commission um, in the first place. So encouraging and I appreciate the hard work that everybody's put in to get us to this point. Commissioner Davis? Sure, two quick things. You know, uh, congratulations to Marley. I'm sorry she's not here, but as a guardian of the corridor at the Children's Museum and, and if she, as she looks back when she's 50 years old, she'll look back and, and think about how that has impacted her career and you know what an important role she played during a pandemic of all things. Um, and thank you to her mom for driving her there every time she volunteered. You know, the, the 25 years of the Children's Museum is a very significant time in our community or a point in our community, but um, there was a board of directors that worked hard before that 25 years, and I happen to be one of those, so that's how long ago I was on that board. Um, so it's, it's actually more like a 30 year anniversary of the start when, when Nina really got our group together. Um, also, I was very pleased with Mary Tavernini Dowling who talked about the Beacon House impact on the community and already the people in the two months, um, they, they um, anticipated that it's 100,000 that they spent in the community. They added 20 people to their role, their pay payroll, and the impact is probably a million a year. That's very significant, and, and it shows how important that group of volunteers is to our community. Thank you. I just want to confirm with the city manager, our work session is at 5.30 tomorrow. There's some confusion if it's 5 or 5.30. 5.30. And it's at the Municipal Service Center. At the Municipal Center. Service Center. Thank you, and that's a joint work session with the Planning Commission, which is, I believe, their regular meeting time is why we did it that way. So mm -hmm. I believe that's all I had. I think that the commission covered the comments tonight. Appreciate all of your hard work, especially staff and to the organizations behind the scenes helping meet our goals. Um, turn things over to Karen. Any comments from you this evening? Just real brief. I know Mary had, had left and, and uh, Commissioner Davis has mentioned it, but um, Mary really is a wonderful community member um, that is really interested in working with the city and really trying to promote, yes, the Beacon House, but also improve our city and to make it a spotlight for those that are coming in a dark time. Um, so the amount of detail that was put into that facility, but then also the amount of care um, is really is really astronomical. And so uh, Mary is very emotional about it, so, <laughs> um, but she has a lot of passion and I had the honor to tour that facility and then also um, revisit it again just this past week. So it was a brief reminder. And uh, just a quick um, statement here as, as a outsider coming in now, what a really cool community to be a part of and what a great um, city to be a part of right now. Um, we're talking about salamanders that closed down a road, um, an all-inclusive playground, and then also paving the way for other cities to become a smart city and to become cleaner and greener. 
this really truly is an important time for all of us and I'm really, really proud to be here. So thank you. And uh, you covered all my other announcements. So see you all tomorrow. Sounds great. Thank you. We are adjourned at 7.34 p.m. Thanks everyone.